Webster of Reservoir Engineering. I'm going to cover some of the basics that come from the Will Height book. The Will Height book is an SPE monograph, and uh, feel free to get that SPE monograph book from the SPE bookstore. So that should be available, or it could be available on Amazon, but you'll get a cheaper price if you're an SPE member from the SPE bookstore. As an outline of the presentation, I'll cover basic water oil flow properties, oil displacement efficiency, the mobility ratio, aerial sweep efficiency. I'll talk about reservoir heterogeneity, vertical and volumetric sweep efficiencies, and methods of predicting water flow performance. And then I'll talk about how to set up a pilot water flood. First, I want to start off with the video of what exactly is reservoir engineer, or what exactly is water flooding. So let me let me see if I can play this. It looks like it's not letting me play. So this is the water flooding. Take a quick look at this. You have a natural water table. You have water extracted by the water supply well. And it's sent to an injection plant. Water is then pumped into the injection well. And then I have a challenge question for all of you guys, and you can type this in the chat. What kind of pattern is this flooding? And you guys can answer that in the chat. But we'll be able to figure that answer later on in the presentation. And if you guys already answered this question in your head or in the chat, then you probably already answered this question. It is a five spot pattern. Let's see what people have said in the five spot, correct. Good job. Well, now let me go back to sharing my presentation screen. Give me one minute. Okay. Basic water oil flow properties. I'll first define what exactly is wettability. It's the interaction of two miscible phases, such as oil and water, and a solid surface. The solid surface is taken as a smooth, flat surface, and then you have rock wettability. And the rock wettability is represented by the Young Dupre equation where you have the surface tension of oil to the surface minus the surface ten or interfacial tension of the water to the surface is equal to the interfacial tension of oil to water and cosine of the contact angle. And this is shown down here of what each term represents in the Young Dupre equation, where you have the interfacial tension of the oil to the surface, interfacial tension of water to surface, and that's equal to this times your co cosine of your contact angle. This is what you have for a water wet, where your contact angle, it's going from the non-wetting to the wetting phase, or wetting to the non-wetting phase, and then you have your oil wet right here, where you have your contact angle that's greater than 90 degrees. Now I'll go through some more definitions. Inhibition is when the wetting phase displaces the non-wetting phase. Drainage is when the non-wetting phase displaces the wetting phase. Hysteresis is the value of a physical property that lags behind the changes of the effect causing it. And here is a test procedure for inhibition to, I mean, to test inhibition. You have a core plug immersed, immersed in oil. The volume of water is displaced by the inhibition of oil, and it's measured after 20 hours of immersion. It is centrifuged under kerosene, and total volume of water is display, uh, displaced as measured. The centrifuge in water and total volume of oil is displaced and is measured. The higher the displacement ratio of water to oil, it's water wet. 
and the higher the displacement ratio of oil to water, that is considered as oil wet. And this is known as the AMET in the uh, displacement test. This is like the AMET procedure to determine your wettability. But there's so many other procedures out there to determine wettability. This is just one example. There are other methods of determining wettability. For instance, there's a capillary, capillary metric method. This is where fluid will displace another through a glass capillary. The limitation here is that, that glass is assumed to be representative of the reservoir rock. The wettability number and the apparent contact angle, that's the displacement of water by oil and the displacement of oil by air. Then you have NMR or nuclear magnetic relaxation. So that's a rock sample exposed to a strong magnetic field and then a weak magnetic field. And then the lost magnetism rate is measured, which is known as relaxation. There's a linear relation observed between the relaxation rate and the fractional oil wet surface area. And then you have relative water wettability, where the rock is covered by water and is considered water wet if methylene blue is absorbed. For, here's a couple of visuals that I have over here that fluid distribution, for fluid distribution, the pore geometry is imperative. If you have poor pore geometry or if you have, if it's not uniform, then you have a, a, a lower chance of having a good air sweep efficiency. If you have a uniform pore geometry and if you have a consolidated pore geometry, your air sweep efficiency would be, would be a lot higher. So this is just giving you an example of what happens during the, during the life of the, of the flood. Shortly after breakthrough, you have some of your non-wetting fluid that's within the pore geometry for the fluid distribution. And then later on in the flood life, you have a lot of the non-wetting fluid as part of the fluid distribution. And then you have this transition over here where early in the drive, you have mostly oil, midway in the drive, you have less oil, and then when you're flooded out, then you have very you know, minimal oil. You have probably residual oil saturation. And same thing goes over here, and, that, and that's primarily been in a water wet rock. And in an oil wet rock, it's a lot harder where you have a lot more oil that is in that is the, that has the affinity to stick to some of your to some of your pool, to some of your grains yeah to some of your grains so during the you would really have to determine what's the economic limit of your of your water flood to know how much is worth it okay i was muted before there are other concepts and basic water oil properties. For instance, there's capillary pressure. I talked a little bit about it in the capillarimetric method. That's the pressure of the non-wetting phase minus the pressure of the wetting phase. You have relative permeability. That's the effective permeability but divided by a specific base permeability. The ability of a porous system to conduct one fluid when other phases are present. And then you have conate water saturation, where the water saturation existing in the reservoir at discovery. You have other methods of measuring water oil flow properties. For instance, you have a flood pot test. That's a cylindrical core samples and they're flooded inside out. You have steady state tests, and then you have external drive techniques, which is that buckley lever frontal advance equation. And I'll talk a little bit more about buckley lever in, the, in, more, in future slides, which is this one. So you have a frontal advance theory of fractional flow, where you have the fractional flow of water is equal to one plus your permeability times your relative permeability of oil divided by your initial viscosity and divided by your oil viscosity. And then you have, it's with respect to the changes of your pressure over the change in your length times your, uh, it's times your gravity times your density and sign of your uh, and it's sign of your, the, the angle at which you're, you're vertically moving, divided by one plus your viscosity of water divided by your viscosity of oil times your oil permeability divided by your water permeability. This can be reduced to this relation because we don't always have the change in your pressure with respect to the change in length. And then it's for a horizontal system, you get rid of this gravity term, and then you end up having this relation. And it can be simplified even more to where your fractional flow is equal to your, your flow of water divided by your total fluid. 
Here are some of the oil displacement efficiency plots for your fractional flow curve. You have your fractional flow in the y-axis here in your left chart, and then you have your water saturation in the x-axis here, which is your, uh, your water saturation as a percentage of the pore volume. You have, and then I'll ask a question in the chat is when can you, uh, when can you determine what the breakthrough time is when you're looking at these plots? but this gives you a visual of the fractional flow curve for a water wet rock and then the fractional flow curve for a strongly oil wet rock. The biggest takeaway here is that it takes a long time to reach breakthrough for your oil wet rock versus your water wet rock. For the frontal advance equation, there is another relation here where you're changing length with respect to time for a specific water saturation is equal to your total rate divided by your cross-sectional area times your porosity and then the changes of your fractional flow divided by, I mean, with respect to your change in water saturation at a specific time. So in layman's terms, it is the rate of a plane of fixed water saturation is equal to the total fluid velocity multiplied by the change in composition of the flowing stream caused by a small change in the saturation of the displacing fluid. There are other, there, so the assumption, especially for Buckley Leverett, is that when you reach breakthrough time or whenever you're flooding, your water flood, it is a piston-like displacement, meaning like the oil phase is not behind any of the, any of the water whenever you're displacing your, your oil. However, there are other theories out there that instead of piston-like displacement, you could have water turning, which is contrary to the frontal advance equation. This is more focused on edge water encroachment, but the theory could apply to horizontal system. Water displaces by oil or by water underwriting the oil, which is known as tonguing. So this is relevant for some experiments, but I would, but uh, from other, from almost all experiments, buckle leather has been successful. That means there has been some evidence of piston-like displacement. There's also viscous fingering. There's the existence of fingers or the discrete streamers of displacing water moving through oil. And that's shown in the chart down here of what this split or what this disfingering looks like at different uh, water productions. And then you have the mobility of conate water that in water wet rocks, it is possible to have conate water displace the oil, which itself is displaced by injected water. However, there are not enough studies for oil wet rocks. This has been, excuse me, this has been shown in water wet rocks. Now I'll talk about the practical application of the frontal advancement theory. You have the recovery at water breakthrough. So your saturation of water at breakthrough minus your critical water saturation is equal to your reciprocal of the change in your fractional flow curve divide or fractional flow with respect to the change in water saturation at a specific fractional flow and then that is equal to your or yeah or, yeah and that is equal to your final water saturation minus your critical water saturation over your final fractional flow and then the performance after water breakthrough is your water saturation minus your initial water saturation. And then this is just giving you what the, what the final water saturation looks like over here. So the tangent point at your SW2, your final water saturation, it just represents the water saturation at the producing end of the system. The value of the fractional flow at the point of tangency is the producing water cut. The saturation at which the tangent exet, uh, intersects at your fractional flow equals to one is your average water saturation. And the inverse slope of the tangent is equal to the cumulative injected fluid in the pore volumes or your QI. The saturation distribution during your water, the saturation is the distribution during your water flooding. And then it's the, you can figure out the saturation distribution during the water flooding, and then you can also modify for the presence of mobile conic water saturation through this relation over here. So that's one minus the initial fractional flow at your, at your initial water saturation divided by your saturation of water of the breakthrough minus your critical water saturation. 
And this gives you a better visual of what I said in the previous slide, where you have your water saturation at breakthrough, and then you have your fractional flow at the, at the at, at, you have your fractional flow, your final fractional flow, and then you have your final water saturation, and then you have your critical water saturation here. So the tangent at SW2, which is your final water saturation, represents the end of the system. The value of the fractional flow at the point of tangency is your producing water cut. The saturation at which the tangent intersects at FW equals one is your average water saturation. And then the inverse slope of the tangent is equal to the cumulative injected fluid in the, in the pore volume. So the inverse slope of this tangent is equal to the cumulative injected fluid in pore volumes. The other concepts in oil displacement efficiency, for instance, rock wettability on oil production performance that's much more efficient when the wetting phase displaces the non-wetting phase than the other way around. Oil and water viscosities, high oil viscosity results in less efficient displacement, formation and dip rate. When the water displaces the oil up dip, there's more efficient displacement at lower rates. High, and there are higher rates the other way around. As the dip increases, the efficiency increases up dip and decreases down dip. Then you have initial gas saturation. It depends on the magnitude of trapped gas existing at the water flood front. Now I'll talk about mobility ratio. And the mobility of displacing fluid or water divided by the mobility of displaced fluid, which is oil. And your mobility ratio, this M, is equal to your relative permeability of your water divided by your viscosity of water times your viscosity of oil divided by your relative permeability of oil. In the fractional flow equation, the ratio of relative permeabilities is the ratio of one given saturation or one point in the reservoir. And in the mobility ratio equation, the water permeability is that in the water contacted portion of the reservoir, and the oil permeability is that in the oil bank. So there's two different points in the, in the reservoir. Here's some plots over here as far as the effect of oil viscosity on water oil mobility ratio with the given water viscosity. In the water wet, you have in the, in the water wet system, your mobility ratio is uh, is actually a lot lower. It is a little bit lower compared to your oil wet uh, mobility uh, compared to your oil wet system. And then you use your mobility ratio with respect to the break thread aerial sweep efficiency. So at higher mobility ratios, your aerial sweep efficiency is a little bit um, is a little bit lower. But this is your aerial sweep efficiency at a at a five spot pattern. And this is primarily for, uh, for if you're displacing water with, with oil. Now I'll talk about what aerial sweep efficiency is. It's the percentage of total oil reservoir or pour volume, which is within the area that's being swept of oil by water. And here are the different types of patterns that you have over here. Or you have a four spot, a skew four spot, a five spot, a seven spot, inverted seven spot, nine spot, inverted nine spot, direct line drive, and a staggered line drive. You have these ratio of producing wells to injection wells and the drilling pattern that's required. You have an equilateral triangle for your four spot, a square for your skew four spot, a square for your five spot, an equilateral triangle for your seven spot, a equilateral triangle for your inverted seven spot, a square for your nine spot, a square for your inverted nine spot, a rectangle for a direct line drive, and offset line of wells for a staggered line drive. Here are the, the visuals for each of the types of setups for your water flooding that I mentioned before. Your triangles are your injection wells, your circles are your producing wells, and your pattern boundaries represented by the dashed line. So that's where your equilateral triangle comes in with the regular four spot. You have your skewed four spot over here with your isosceles triangles, I guess you can call that. Or it was called a square before uh, for the type of skewed four spot. 
excuse me. You have your normal nine slot well, then you have your inverted one where you have uh, more inje more producers that, as then you have injectors. So when it's normal, you have more injectors than you have producers and you have inverted, you have more producers than you have injectors. And if you're five spot where you have a square, you have your direct line drive, you have staggered line drive here where your pattern boundaries are the different, are, are, are in different uh, directions. Then you have your seven spot and then you have your inverted seven spot. So then here are some prediction methods for aerial sweep efficiency. The dyes method, it's displaceable volume and fraction of the total flow coming from the swept portion of the pattern. You can calculate the total recovery from the pattern, your aerial sweep efficiency and your flood displacement efficiency. You have producing water ore ratio, assuming that water is only being produced from the swept region. You also have cumulative injected water volume. From the Craig method, you have the prediction for a five stop pattern. For rapport uh, at, at, at al, you have the com you can compare the they compare the five spot pattern with the liner system, and with Kratz, you have the five spot pattern and assumed piston like displacement. There are other factors affecting aerial sweep efficiency. For example, you have cross flooding, then you have directional permeability or heterogeneity due to different permeability. You have formation dip. The sweep is affected, but fluid injectivities are not. You have off pattern wells, where you have oil recovery at breakthrough. It's always lower at an off pattern injection well. You have sweep beyond the normal well pattern. You have end to end flooding. And then you also have horizontal fractures affecting your aerial sweep efficiency. There's also factors affecting uh, a selection for a water flood pattern. For example, things to take into consideration when you're selecting a water flood pattern. Provide the desired oil production capacity, you need to have sufficient water injection rate to yield the desired oil productivity. You need to maximize your oil recovery with the minimum water production. You also need to take advantage of known reservoir non-uniformities, such as directional permeability, regional permeability differences, and formation fractures, your dip, etc and you need to be compatible with existing well patterns and require a minimum of new wells. And you need to be compatible with flooding operations of other operators and adjacent leases. There, now I'll talk a little bit about reservoir heterogeneity. The types of reservoir heterogeneity are aerial permeability, vertical permeability, and reservoir scale fractures and directional permeability. You, the quantification for heterogeneity is a conformance factor, which I mentioned before with respect to pore geometry. So there's a portion of the reservoir contacted by the injective fluid, so that combines aerial and vertical sweep effects. You have the positional approach, where you're using core permeabilities to define layer properties. You have the coefficient of permeability variation. You have permeability ordering. You have the Lorentz coefficient. So that's characterizing the permeability distribution within a pay section. So a zero, the closer you are to zero, that means the closer you are to uniform permeability. The closer you are to one, that means the closer you are to non-uniform permeability. So that's a lot more heterogeneity. Averaging permeabilities is a way to quantify reservoir heterogeneity. You need to have statistical reservoir zonation techniques. So you need to provide some probabilistic techniques to determine your reservoir heterogeneity and you need to know what kind of distribution there is. And then there's also geological zonation. Are you going to be flooding through multiple zones? For vertical sweep efficiencies and volumetric sweep efficiencies, I have a couple of slides on this as well. For vertical sweep efficiency, it's the measure of a two-dimensional effect of reservoir non-uniformities. And for volumetric sweep efficiency, you have a pore volume contacted by the injective fluid divided by the total pore volume of a pattern of a portion of a reservoir of interest. So the mobility ratio influence, so your injected water, so this is pretty much your relation between your injected water and your, and, and your thickness 
your total permeability, your relative permeability of water, the injection pressure minus your external pressure or the reservoir pressure, divided by your viscosity of water times the logarithm of your radius of your water to oil, and divided by the radius of your well bore, and plus your mobility ratio and the logarithmic of your external radius over your well bore radius. And then RWO is your radius of your leading edge of the water bank. So that's the water oil interface. Here's the plot below of your relative injectivity and then your flood front and your radius. So as you increase in your flood front radius and at different mobility ratios, you're declining your relative injectivity. But as your mobility ratio increases, you have in you have a better relative injectivity for your mobility uh, based on, on your mobility ratio. Here are other plots for volumetric efficiencies and the influence of your mobility ratio. Again, at higher mobility ratios, you're going to have a better aerial swoop efficiency. And then your radius of the flood front in a more permeable layer. At higher mobility ratios, you have a better injectivity ratio here. So this is a fluid injectivity contrast in a two-layered liquid fluid radial system. And based on your, and this is just to show you that at a higher, at a higher radius of your flood front, you're going to have better, uh, and, and at a high mobility ratio, you're just going to have a better injectivity ratio. And then your breakthrough time is also going to be at, uh, at a lower aerial sweep efficiency when you have a higher mobility ratio. And that's shown in the plot to the left over here. I'll now talk about the influence of gravity forces. So that's the degree of gravity segregation of the injected fluid, and that's measured in terms of the volumetric sweep efficiency at breakthrough. And it depends upon the ratio of viscous forces to gravity forces. The higher rates that you have, that means you have higher volumetric sweeps. So this plot below shows the volumetric sweep efficiency at breakthrough. And then you have your, and then your influence of your gravity forces. That means if you have a uniform system with gravity effects at, if you have a uniform system with gravity effects, you're sloping upward, and that means you have a better volumetric sweep efficiency. If you have no gravity effects, your volumetric sweep efficiency is going to be relatively the same. And then um, at a non-uniform, I mean, at non-uniform, it really does depend at a, it really does depend on how your how your sweep efficiency is going to be affected. But if you have a uniform system with gravity effects, then you're going to have an increasing, you're going to have an increasing volumetric sweep efficiency. Now I'll talk about the influence of capillary forces. The highest oil recovery was obtained at the lowest separating water injection rate. The difference in performance depends if there's more permeable layer that's at the top or the bottom. And then due to capillary pressure of the volume of oil produced at a given injected water volume, that's de that decreases slightly with the rate whenever there's a significant increase in water oil ratio. I'll talk about the influence of cross flow. That tends to improve the recovery performance at a favorable mobility ratio, and the reverse occurs at unfavorable mobility ratios. So a cross flow can improve the recovery performance, but it depends if you have a good, if you have a high mobility ratio. Now I'll talk about the rate effects on volumetric sweep efficiency. The, rock, the range of rock permeabilities within a specific reservoir, the rock's attraction for the wetting phase is stronger the lower the permeability, but the ease of flow also decreases. For the size and location of less permeable zones, now control the number of opportunities for the injected water to imbibe into the streaks. Isolated, dispersed, and tighter lenses will allow more inhibition, and thus higher oil displacement will occur if the low permeability rock exists in a thick, continuous zone. And finally, the wettability preference of a reservoir rock. The rate of inhibition will depend directly on the degree of rock's wettability preference for water. Now I'll talk about the effect of layer selection on volumetric sweep efficiencies. So a large number of layers, you'd have the most permeable layer would have a higher absolute permeability value. 
and so that the early water breakthrough to the production can be expected. Choosing a small number of layers can sometimes result in a predicted performance approaching that of a uniform system. And you could choose the number of layers based on equal flow capacity or equal K of H or your palm times your thickness. And this can control your early water oil ratio and breakthrough time. I'll talk about the methods of predictive water flow performance. I'll first discuss your re reservoir heterogeneity, your aerial sweep effects. Then I'll talk about some numerical methods and empirical methods. For reservoir heterogeneity, there are methods concerned with the effects of bearing injectivity layer by layer in the radial portion of the reservoir surrounding the injection well. Methods concerned with oil recovery are layer by layer. Methods that characterize reservoir non-uniformities by their permeability distribution and calculate the overall effect. There's the Euster suter calvin method. So that water flood has three stages, radial outward, interference with other water floods, and constant water injectivity. That's what they've gotten out of their study. The Pratt's Matthews Jewett Baker method, they added the combined effects of mobility ratio and aerial sweep efficiency. The Styles method, accounts for different flood front positions and liquid field linear layers having different permeabilities. And then there's the Dijkstra-Parsons method, which is the most, it's the, it's the most famous method, I would say. And that's the correlation between water flood recovery and mobility ratio and permeability distribution. For aerial sweep, you have the Muscat method, which is a streamline and isopotential distributions in various flooding patterns. That yields aerial sweep efficiencies at water breakthrough for a unit mobility ratio. You have the Hurst method, which you have an increase in area sweep efficiency obtainable after water breakthrough by continued water injection. You have the Cottle method, which is focused on a four spot, five spot, nine spot, seven spot, and line drive patterns. You have the Aronofsky method, where they focus on the five spot and line drive method and the aerial sweep efficiency and found the aerial sweep efficiency as a function of the mobility ratio. That's for some of the plots that I've shown in the previous slides. And you have the depth hobble method where they focus on five spot and line drive methods and other patterns. The displacement took place along stream tubes that joined injection to production wells. And that assumes that oil saturation was reduced to residual oil saturation at the flood front. Now I will talk about the prediction methods focused on displacement. So we've already talked about buckley leverett and the frontal advancement equation assuming a piston-like displacement. You have the Craig Geffen Morse, which is a five-spot model, and they focus on gas water drives. The Purpur and Carpenter Leas. They've done the linear and five-spot behavior relationship investigation, so they compared the linear versus your five-spot behavior. Higgins and Lighten, it's a streamlined channel flow method pattern, which is a number of parallel flow tubes whose boundaries are the streamlines and they're generated by unit mobility ratio. Then you have mathematical models such as the Douglas, Blair, and Wagner, which is your capillary and viscous effects simulated in the linear model. Then you have the Hyatt, which is a vertical coverage, vertical sweep attained by a water flood in a stratified reservoir. Then you have the Douglas Peaceman Ratchford, Ratchford method. So that's relative permeabilities, fluid viscosities, densities, gravity, and capillary pressure. Then you have the Warren and Cosgrove met, uh, mathematical models where they focus on mobility of cross flow effects in a reservoir whose permeabilities are log normally distributed. Then you have the Morel and Seitu, which is a pattern geometry and mobility ratio on water flood recovery. You have gravity and capillary effects are neglected. I'll now talk about the empirical methods. You have the Guthrie Greenberger method, which is 73 sandstone reservoirs with combined solution gas drive and water drive. The oil recovery is related to permeability, porosity, and oil viscosity, formation thickness, current water saturation, depth, 
or reservoir volume factor, area, and well spacing. Then you have the shower method, which is based on past performances of five floods to predict the water flood recoveries of the Illinois Basin. And that's the oil production response as a function of the Lorenz coefficient. The higher coefficient, you have lower oil production, so more heterogeneity, you have lower oil production. You have the Guerrero air logger. That's the oil production first begins when the injected water volume is from 60 to 80 percent of the gas filled reservoir space. Water flood oil producing rates peak immediately after fill up and remain to that level for four to ten months of the period. And the period of peak production will occur when the ratio of water injection rates to oil producing rate ranges from two to twelve with values of four to six that are typical for a flood and the oil production rate will decline thereafter at a rate of 30 to 70% per year. Then there was an API statistical study of 312 reservoirs. They developed correlations for water drive recovery for sandstone and sand reservoirs and for solution gas drive recoveries from sandstones, sands, and carbonates. So water flooding prediction methods as an overall as an overall takeaway, you could provide ultimate water flood oil recovery, composite producing water oil ratio versus recovery, composite values of injection rate, producing rate, producing water oil ratio, oil recovery, and cumulative injection water versus, and all of that versus time. Individual injection rates and cumulatives and individual producing rates, water oil ratio and oil recoveries, and that's all versus time. Yeah, factors affecting water, water flood oil recovery performance. Here's some questions you need to answer for yourself on, you know, on when designing a water flood or predicting a water flood's performance. Is the reservoir likely to perform as a series of independent layers or as zones of different permeability with fluid cross flow? Are there zones of high gas saturation or high water saturation that could serve as channels for bypassing water? Does the reservoir contain long natural fractures or directional permeability that could cause preferential area movement in some direction? Are there areas of high and low permeability that might cause unbalanced flood performance? Is cross bedding present to the degree that fluid communication between injection and producing wells might be impaired? Is the reservoir likely to contain planes of weaknesses or closed natural fractures that would open at the bottom hole injection pressures? There are some limitations for pilot water flooding that I do want to talk about. So with the small pilot, there's a probability of locating it in a non-representative portion of the reservoir that's increased. There are the effects of damaged wells will be more pronounced with a small number of wells. There's oil migration losses from a single pilot pattern that may yield an estimated recovery lower than to be realized from a full-scale flood. Injected water may be lost outside of the pilot area, suggesting a higher injected water requirement than for a full-scale water flood. There's some information obtainable from pilot water floods. So here's some positives. There are typically single five spot and single injection floods. The ratio of a well diameter to a distance between injector and producer. You have the ratio of pressure drawdown at producing wells to the pressure increase at injecting wells. You have the effect of producing rates and mobility ratio on a particular pattern. You have the effect of initial gas saturation on a single injection well pilot. And then you have the condition ratio. The condition ratio is the ratio of a flow capacity of the reservoir as determined by the productivity index data. So the flow capacity determined from pressure buildup data. Here are some design considerations for pilot flooding. You have to be located in a portion of the reservoir representative of oil saturation, permeability, and reservoir heterogeneity for the remainder of the reservoir. You need to be composed of single of, or multiple five spot patterns with producers simul simulated so that they have a condition ratio of 2.22 or above. You have injection rates for each injector proportional to the product of porosity and net paint thickness of areas surrounding each injector. And that concludes my presentation and I am open for any questions. If you also want to ask me for questions, I, I wrote down where else you can connect with me. You can connect with me on LinkedIn, on Instagram, or on Twitter.
and I'll stop sharing my screen. I'll pass it all along to you, uh, Petra Booster or Michelle. Yes, ma'am. Wow, I got 11 questions here. Oh. Let me, wow, okay. Well, this is going to be great. So the first question I got is, is it advisable to do tertiary recovery before secondary recovery? For example, doing surfactant blood right after the primary recovery to recover both available and trapped oil together. That's a great question. Typically, you don't know, typically, I would say it's better to do secondary recovery before the tertiary recovery because you're, when you look at when you look at the percentage recoveries you get from your primary and your secondary recovery, your, uh, your tertiary recovery has a wide range. So I would say that if you still have plenty of, it depends on how much oil you have. And if it's residual oil that you're trying to get rid of, then I would say you do tertiary recovery and then you don't do secondary recovery at all. But if you still have oil saturation that's greater than your than your residual oil saturation, I would say you do your second recovery first. Why was the oil FW versus FW curve the bent higher at higher fraction flow curve compared to the water curve? <coughs> Excuse me. Having okay, let me check my let me share my screen again. Uh, higher than it was. Okay, let me let me see my chats again. Why was the oil FW versus SW Gore having a bend to higher? That's because it's an oil wet reservoir compared to a water wet. How long does it take to generate an F in a core? I don't know the exact answer to that, but I would say it would take some time. We prefer to keep mobility ratio less in order to better displace oil. We prefer to keep mobility ratio. Well, if you look at the mobility ratio equation, let's see. If you look at the mobility ratio equation, you're either looking at higher oil viscosity or higher relative water permeability to give you a higher mobility ratio. So it depends on how you're increasing that mobility ratio. I would say that if you're increasing a higher relative water permeability, then you would need to have a higher mobility ratio. But if you're trying, but if you have a like very viscous oil, then you would have, then I would say keep the mobility ratio smaller. What is cross flooding and cross bedding? Cross flooding is flooding between different layers. And cross bedding, um, yeah, cross flooding is flooding between different layers, and cross bedding is you have um, is you have different formations. Yeah, you, have, you, you have different lithologies for a couple formations that intersect with each other. Adjacent leases means adjacent other operators blocks. Yes. What are methods to quantify reservoir heterogeneity without doing core tests? Can we calculate in situ apart from tracers? Your best tests are going to come from core and calculate in situ apart from tracers. You can try from tracers, but tracers will only tell you what's been displaced as opposed to heterogeneity. By gravity effects, did you mean the dip of the reservoir or different density of injective fluid with in situ fluid? I meant the dip of the reservoir. How do you calculate pressure inject in injection wells in a recap on condition ratio? Let me answer the condition ratio question really quickly. Um, your condition ratio, condition ratio is a ratio of your flow capacity of the reservoir as determined by the productivity index data and the flow capacity from the pressure buildup data. So that's your flow capacity determined by your PI and then your 
flow capacity determined by your pressure buildup. So you have to do two different tests for your condition ratio. And then let's see what other question you had. Um, how do you calculate? I don't know what IMNC is. Injection wells. Oh, how do you increase that the pressure increase on injection wells? Is it that okay? Pressure increase. So at injection wells, your pressure increase. I didn't write the equation here, but there is an equation to calculate your injection. So uh, this is your closest for your relative injectivity. And what you can do is you can solve for the pressure increase. You can rearrange this equation for the pressure increase. Those are some great questions. Another question I got is, is it better to inject in the aquifer zone than oil zone? Well, that's a great question. It depends on the quality of your aquifer. If you have a partial aquifer, for instance, and if you have a poor aquifer, then you would inject into that. Then you'd inject into the oil zone. But if you have a strong aquifer, and if you need to, uh, and if you need to provide some extra energy to the aquifer, then you can probably inject into aquifer. What well, parameter is important during the water flooding operation? Well, the parameters that are important during the water flooding operation. There are a lot of parameters that are important during the water flooding operation. You need to know what, how homogeneous or heterogeneous your oil or your reservoir is. You need to know how consolidated your 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 how consolidated your your rock is. You need to know how uniform your rock grains are, for instance. Um, and then, what is the book you are using to extract these correlations? This is the real height book. It's uh, I think it's SP. Great to ask more questions in the chat. This is great. On the mobility ratio question, what is our general objective? Do we want to increase the, oh, you want to increase it with respect to relative water permeability, or relative water permeability. Any other questions? mechanism is suitable for low salinity water flooding in carbonate reservoirs? Low salinity water flooding. Well, I mean, you could use you could use secondary recovery here. I don't know what exactly you're referring to for the mechanism. I would say you can use secondary recovery for low salinity water flooding. Oil we bypass will oil bypassing happen if we increase the mobility ratio? That's a really great question. If you're assuming your piston displacement, then you wouldn't be bypassing oil. And in your if you're in a water wet reservoir, you wouldn't be bypassing oil. <laughs> Any other questions? I don't think I have any other questions. I'll hand it back to you, Nishani. Nishani, I think you're on mute. Yes, ma'am. I think we have one more question. Oh, how does scholastic polymer flooding increase the displacement efficiency? I would say it depends on that. Um, yeah, I would say. I would say, again, it depends on your readability. I, I it, it really does depend. I, I, it does depend on your readability. If you're able to have a high enough injection pressure for your polymer flooding, 
and to change the and to alter the wettability, especially for oil wet reservoirs. And if you're able to displace it depending on the viscosity of your fluid, then that's how you can increase your displacement efficiency. It really just depends on, uh, on how you're injecting it and then your viscosity differences between, your, between what you're trying to displace versus what you're displacing it with. Please type the book. Um, I guess it's from Will Heights. Um, it's an SPE monograph. Water flooding. A question from yesterday's session, recoverable reserves calculated with kind or with kind curve analysis. How else do you validate it? That's a great question. I would say you can validate it through simulation, or you could also validate it. Yeah, you could validate it through simulation too, because you're combining the physics in that portion of it as opposed to the empirical method. And yes, Naveen, so injecting affects your rate. I think that's all the questions I have, Rishali. Yes, ma'am. Okay, uh, I'll conclude the session. Uh, thank you so much for a wonderful session. If anybody have any doubt, they can reach out to us through LinkedIn, Insta, or WhatsApp group. Looking forward to have you all again tomorrow as we will be uh, having the last session of this workshop. Thank you so much for cooperating with us. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you all. Of course, thank you for having me. And feel free to connect with me on those platforms I mentioned before. Yes, ma'am.